Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Welcome to the Dark Stoa. This is a very special edition, it appears. Um, okay, first of all, just let us know if it's if the noise is bad and then we'll, we'll move inside. Um, just want to make that clear. Okay, so for those of you who are new to this, these are events where Pat Ryan, the most dangerous man on the internet, walks us through really mind-blowing, challenging concepts, often about the future of humanity. And in this particular series, in season, uh, season two, we're looking at how to break down the blue church using its own methods. And uh, the structure is a lecture essentially for 40 minutes and then a part two where we get to ask questions. And this will be recorded and put on YouTube. So if you don't wanna be seen in the question section but you still wanna ask a question, you can put it in the chat and I can ask it for you. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Pat. sure everything's good here. Hello, everyone. Thank you for waiting this one out. Sorry for the temporary delay to get started here. Um, the last two episodes, um, if you haven't been watching them, have been dedicated to kind of a militant takedown of the Blue Church. And it's been, um, it's fa it was fairly aggressive toned. So in this one, I'm going to tone it down a bit. Um, because in the last episode, I made heavy allusion to the concept of alchemy. And the concept was lost on a, a few points. And so I'm going to dedicate this entire episode to what is alchemy? How did it come to be? Why is it a thing? And what can we do about it? And why am I so focused on it? Um, right now, my mouse is being very erratic. I do apologize. Uh, hold on. This is technical glitches are always a pain. Um, excellent. I'll just do that there. Um, so I would like to get started, but I'm having the worst time trying to get started here. My mouse is really, really on the fritz. So I'm going to wing it. Uh, we're going to we're going to focus on this. Sorry for being flustered, folks. Um, where's the share screen? Here we go. Ah, excellent. So this season is called Devouring Humanism, and that's a play on words. Either the humanism is devouring you or we devour it back. This is episode three, Alchemical Cognition. The reason I'm picking alchem alchemy is because it is the one of the first casualties of the scientific revolution. When scientific methodology came into be, they quickly had a falling out between philosophy and science and said al alchemy needs to go away because we're gonna measure everything. Um, and so for a while, uh, that was okay, and we got all kinds of cool things out of it, like computers or Coca-Cola. Uh, that was not a Coca-Cola ad. They're not paying me. Um, but the unfortunate part is we're rapidly approaching a situation where we kind of need this again. One, for our own defense, and two, for our own progress. Um, Blue Church will disagree with me heavily on that. So this whole deck is my attempt to explain why you need it. So moving in. Alchemy. Chem. That's it. It's chem. Al is the Islamic addition meaning the, but chem, where did chem come from? Uh, it came from Ham, surprisingly, um, the son of Noah. Uh, and we're all technically members of the prestigious Noah Yacht Club, according to the Bible. And uh, he had a couple kids. One of them was Ham. And uh, that was going well uh, for a little bit. You know, put all the animals in the boat. And then it all went pretty well until Noah had some rowdy naked juice. And uh, all of a sudden, there was Noah's ding-dong fiasco where Ham saw his dad naked, and that didn't go so well for him. So he cursed him and he said, you have the curse of Ham. You're going to be a servant forever. Um, now, Ham wasn't necessarily a servant, but his son was, uh, Canon, I believe. So that's, uh, this, is, this is where the Ham comes from. Now, and we call it Ham now because ham is often delicious, uh, but in the region where this word originated from, it's actually pronounced ham, so ham, right? Um, so you have uh, that, that, that guttural ch noise. So when it was first written down in English, uh, or at least other languages, Latinized languages, it came out as, ch uh, as cham, actually, uh, even though it's pronounced ham. So it came out as cham when, when you wrote it down. Well, cham 
is uh, there's a reason for that. Because uh, it turns out a lot of Ham's descendants became Egyptians. That's actually the lineage of Ham. His, uh, a lot of his, uh, his, his descendants became Egyptians. Now, uh, the word Egypt comes from the Greek Egyptus, uh, which means burnt face. Boy, that's some racism right there. Um, but also, uh, there's another uh, definition of, of uh, Egypt as well. It's called Chem, because uh, the sons of the sons of Noah, the sons of Ham, the sons of Ham, and that that's Chem. So uh, that's a kind of this weird evolution of, of etymology here, where uh, <laughs> uh, it becomes, the, 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 surprisingly, even Syria calls itself the land of Ham. Uh, and that's actually an important part of the apocalypse uh, mythology of Islam as well. So you see a lot of radical Islamists, uh, they, they actually used this uh, apocryphy notation to actually attract some of the more serious jihadists uh, into that region, which is going very poorly for everyone involved. Um, but this is all direct of, of Hammon, even like when, um, when American slavery was uh, up and roaring, a lot of the biblical justification was to say, well, you're slaves because that's the curse of Ham. You know, you're, that's, that's life. Sorry, pal, you got cursed by Noah because you saw us ding dong, so now you're slaves forever. Um, not exactly the best rationalization, but it's all they had at the time. Um, and so Kemet was also a part of Egypt and it meant the black lands. And the Arabic word for alchemy, which is alchemia, uh, it means the Egyptian science. So alchemy literally translates to the black arts for all of these reasons. That's where, you know, you hear the mystical black art wording. This is the etymology of it. And now that I've taken you um, down this kind of Pepe Silvia route of how this word came to be, uh, we can actually move on and, and talk about, you know, what is it actually talking about? It's not necessarily just, oh, what are these Egyptians doing? Although, comparatively speaking, they built fucking mountains. Like, that's amazing, right? So what kind of black magic were they using there? So that's, that was also part of the mythology. Um, and this is like, like antiquity, Bronze Age stuff. So we'll, we'll move into how the Grecians got involved in this. Um, going back to the Egyptian mythology, we start with Imhotep. He was the advisor of jo uh, Djoser, and he was the world's first deified autist. Uh, the guy was a brilliant mathematician, geometrist, and uh, architect for all kinds of pyramids. Um, and because of his brilliance, he was actually deified. Surprisingly, and his deification is often confused uh, with Thoth, who is the moon god of wisdom, magic, causality, measurement, judgment, law, and basically Ra's secretary. So that's Thoth. Um, the idea of like tight measurement, careful, autistic def definitions of everything. Yeah, Imhotep and Thoth are pretty interchangeable. Um, in fact, you see the Im Imhotep, um, where, where Thoth's center was, uh, you see there's, there's often statue confusion between the two. So, also surprisingly, um, Thoth in antiquity, or at least in alchemically, was confused as Moses as well, um, because Moses is the lawgiver, the, the bringer of measurement, the bringer of, of doling out precise units. All these three people are dedicated to, like, measuring stuff. Um, so then we throw in Hermes. Uh, and he's the messenger of the gods and a soul guide who would escort souls into the afterlife. Now, this is a bit of a, a jump saying these things should all get confused together. But remember, the purpose of a messenger was also to bring law and to bring justice. You were to run to this location and bring this measured message to uh, legal delivery. And so all of these things kind of revolve around the same concept, roughly. So what happens when you add them all together? Well, you come up with this guy, whose name I'm always going to mangle. And, uh, it's Hermes Trismegus, that guy, right? You can read. Um, I don't have to pronounce that, but, but that guy, right? So this guy is like this mythical <sighs> Gnostic hermetic entity that pops up whenever societies go total autism. So they go like, they measure everything and they, they're really about pure reason and they're about like sticking to the letter of the law. Well, this guy shows up every so often that happens. Uh, whenever people really like stick to the letter instead of the spirit of the law, this guy comes along in mythological history and, and kind of confuses things. He kind of comes in and says, yeah, but here's some gray area here. There's some weird stuff here. Um, you shouldn't get so hung up on the words and everything else. Um, and so this, this particular Hermes guy is actually an addition of Thoth and Hermes in the Gnostic tradition and the, the Hermetic tradition as well. Um, 
In fact, uh, you may have heard the phrase hermetically sealed in medical contexts. Well, that's where this comes from, the idea of alchemically sealing stuff so air doesn't get in. That was only possible using uh, alchemical processes at the time. And surprisingly, that word has stuck through for most of scientific and medical uh, uh, usage hilariously. Um, so this, this guy is like an archetype that pops up whenever people get too robotic about their own existences. So it makes sense that this guy is popping up now in, uh, in, in the internet place right now. So in addition to that, um, that, that Hermes character, um, that was a, a Grecian-Egyptian fusion. Um, and you see a lot of the alchemists of medieval Europe really go towards that character around the, the 13 and the, and the 1500s. And that makes sense because you know, the, the, the international entity known as the Papal Church was, was really sticking it to people in terms of legal application and you know, follow the letter of the law in addition to the law of your king, follow the law of the Lord, follow the law of God, follow our laws, all these laws all over the place. It's just a mess. Um, so, so when the alchemists of the Middle Ages come into play, their initial obsession is turning lead into gold using what's called the philosopher's stone. And this is where most people kind of get into alchemy, probably because of Harry Potter. Um, but the, uh, uh, it's much more than that. And it's much more than it looks like. The idea that you can turn lead into gold is obviously an attractor for all kinds of talent, people who kind of understand chemistry. You can think of it as a way, because it is, you can think of it as a way to attract people out of their black art covens, which they're scattered all across the place. It's not like there was one black art ac uh, academy that you can go to. Um, you had individual people who were keeping their secrets really tight to their chest. Sometimes stuff worked, sometimes it didn't. But if it worked, it really worked. And you didn't want to share that with everybody. If I knew that these chemical compounds could cure a sickness, yeah, I'm keeping that. Thanks, bro. You can pay me and I'm, I'm just going to rock that all time and no one's going to know. I'm, I'm going to be hesitant to even give that to my apprentices. So how do, you, how do you get all this talent who's really holding it close to the chest, how do you get them out of the shell? How do you get them to play nice and sort of like alchemical open source? Well, you come up with this mythology saying turning lead into gold. So everybody, you know, try your magic stuff. Here we go. We're, op we're opening up the door and everybody try it out. So now because of the promise of wealth, people come out of their, you know, their, hi their hidey holes and now they're actually trying to do the thing. And, and they wrap up this mythology as the philosopher's stone. And there was a time in English history where the philosopher, the people believed the English had a philosopher's stone and that the French were invading to steal it. And that was used as justification to raise like defenses militarily. It, it's, it's a, it was a wild tradition. It was a wildly useful tool to, to rally people. It's almost as if the, the myth of the stone was alchemy in and of itself. Um, and the idea of the stone is really personified in what's known as Emblem 21 of, um, of Michael uh, Myers, Atlantia Fugans. Uh, where he proceeds to write about various different emblems and different types of like mystery histories and stuff like that. And emblem 21 is the ingredients to build a philosophy stone, or I should say the recipe. So um, to make, ma uh, where's my mouse? Um, make of the man and woman a circle, of that a quadrangle, of this a triangle, of the same a circle, and you will have the stone of the philosophers. Now that sounds cryptic. And many people have tried to understand this, and not a lot of people really got it. I like to think I got it. So I'm going to walk you through what I got. Uh, we'll see what happens. Now, I've brought this up before in season one. For all of you that might remember this little snippet from uh, Entropy Remains Undefeated, this whole part about Michael Meyer and the Palantine, he was the court alchemist of the Habsburgs. And uh, this whole, like, you know, these two things, this and this are pretty linked. And we're talking about Egyptians and we're talking about black art and alchemy. And it's all suddenly connected, right? Um, so, so that's, that's where all this comes from. And, and Isaac Newton was a huge practitioner of alchemy. He was, he's considered actually the last magician um, in, in some circles. So th th this whole thing is, is a long tradition um, and it's, it's messy. Uh, everyone's alchemical practices are different everywhere you go. And so because of this, it was the foolish attempt at turning lead into gold. This, this lie, this grand promise that was possible uh, actually directly led to the theory of atomics. Uh, atomic theory in particular, because people were then forced to like, okay, can you actually do the thing? Can you do the thing? It was, it was like a reputation check. It was like a mass, mass accountability effort to say, all right, what can you actually do about nature? And so this pursuit um, <laughs> kind of went to the wayside after the Spanish invaded uh, South America and they brought back all that gold. 
uh, they're eventually so full of gold that they just stopped this, this silly pursuit of the, the Philosopher's Stone after that. They actually uh, did a severe hyperinflation of gold in their, in their economy for like you know, 100 years. It was pretty bad. Uh, and so this is where, because the alchemists are successfully making progress in terms of iterating towards something that's measurable and, and something that's repeatable and something that's more compliant to the scientific methodology instead of like, well, if you boil two frog's legs and you whirl them around your head and you jump up and down, you got a whooping cough cure. Right? You, you can say that all day long, but because the, the pursuit of the, uh, the philosopher's stone and turning lead into gold, that, was, that reputation check actually was beginning to lay the foundation for the scientific methodology and all the things there. Um, and at that point, we're starting to see a divide between philosophy and science. And it ultimately ends up in a fairly hostile divorce. It's Galileo. He's uh, the loather of papal bias in academia. Uh, he, had, uh, he had a lot of beef with the church to the point he got exiled, I think twice, um, from all, all of Christendom. And uh, he, he said, this is stupid. Fuck this. Fuck that. I can actually, you know, that's the moon. I'm going to make you look really close at it. And I think the strongest argument the church had at the time is if you had a really long stick, you could poke the moon. And that was like their strongest counter argument. It's like, uh, I mean, maybe that's a really long stick. Um, but Galileo was able to really lay the foundation, not only scientifically and say, look, I'm not only am I observing these astrological features, I'm going to start predicting them as well. And he does. And people say, oh, shit, there's some, you know, something's here. Um, and so this idea of measuring nature starts to take precedence over, the, over, the, over both the mystical of alchemy and the divine of the church. So you have these two like non-measured things that claim legal authority, and then here comes science. And science is saying, we're measuring stuff now. Fuck off, go away. This is measure time. So this whole, this, this is the beginning of, of the divorce, and we get to the end of the divorce with the Vienna Circle. So these guys, you might recognize a few of these faces, especially Sad Boy over there. Um, but these guys were hell-bent on destroying metaphysics. They just couldn't stand it. They didn't like it. They didn't like any of it. Um, and uh, their names aren't important. You can look them up. If you know them, you know them. If you don't, it doesn't really matter. Um, but this was, this was a group of people who really doubled down hard on, on the measurement century, the idea that everything can be measured. And fuck you, we're going to measure everything, even if you disagree. So now, now science is, is getting its balls and it's starting to charge headlong into politics and into sociology and into every goddamn thing. And it just tries to measure everything. But as we know, when we get into that hyper measurement phase, well, that's where the Hermes character comes in every single time. He always pops back up uh, whenever a society goes hyper measurement like this. So what is that, you know, what is that, what are the terms of that divorce, uh, you know, you take the kids, I'll take the money kind of situation. Um, this is, this is Wint Internet's, everybody's favorite shit poster on, on the internet. Um, Wittgenstein is, is one of the Vienna Circle people. And uh, they finally get around to measure stuff. And maybe if they just keep measuring better, it's going to get better. Then, you know, it doesn't get better. We, we, I'm at the point in my life as a programmer where every time I see a programming gig, I just think I'm building another stupid human trap. It's at, there is no progress. I'm just endlessly iterating towards some psychological thing that can be exploited. And it's, it's just getting silly at this point. So, you know, what, what, what do we do with this? What do we do when everything's measured and we are and everything's predictable and if it isn't predictable, we can just use the law to make it more predictable. How, how, how is alchemy rise from such a embarrassing defeat where everything can be measured and there's, you can't even do this, that, that crazy black art witchcraft stuff anymore. It's a revenge of metaphysics. Well, it turns out um, the AI, the black box, you can't measure it. You can measure the input and the output, but you can't measure what's going on in it. And those Neanderthal brains, that chimeric cognition, not going to measure that either. So now we have this place where all of your rulers and all of your tactics to measure and, and get this, like, you know, fuck metaphysics. Uh, all, this is a hard backstop. This is, this is a hard, like, burp, pump the brakes for a second. Uh, you're not going to get the results you're looking for here. In fact, trying to measure it is mathematically impossible because of certain things like the vanishing gradient and other types of techniques. So you get stuck in this like Gaussian mess when you're dealing with AI and black boxes um, and your techniques of statistics, probability, that's, that's a heuristic of measurement for sure. Um, but when you have entire markets being ran by these black boxes and voting elections and advertising and everything ran by this, I mean, wh what is your science gonna do to that? 
how can you possibly measure that? You, you can't use science anymore. You're going to start cracking down on law. And uh, things get messy. So metaphysics is back, and it's ready for some blood. And these two techniques are, are really, are really going to knock it out the park. So I said I had an, uh, an inkling about the Philosopher's Stone and why it's relevant. So uh, anybody who's been to my site, uh, it's Colt State. This is the background. It's been the long-term background of everything I've done. Um, and it's been this equation. And it's the Philosopher's Stone equation. Now, yes, I am trying to build a Philosopher's Stone. That is true. But it's not the Philosopher's Stone you think. I don't care about lead and gold. That's not what I'm out. That's not what I'm trying to do. Um, uh, and what's to end up happening is because of that mythology of the lead gold, it's actually a, this whole pursuit is, is typically fixated around the quadrangle. Now, what do I mean by that? Whoop, wrong way. So let's take the first part of this equation. Make of the man and woman human relations. We're dealing exclusively with humans first. This is the first part of the alchemical equation. So right off the bat, we start with soul alchemy. That's where we start. We don't start with lead. We don't start with atomic theory. We don't even start with mathematics. We start with people. So we deal with human relations. Once we understand human relations, how to poke and prod, how to make a person do one, how to make a person do the other thing, then from there we can extract a circle. And what's the circle? It's the economy. It's the Ouroboros. The whole purpose of an economy is to have it circular where I put money into it and then it rolls through the economy and then it comes back. I issue credit to you and then you issue it back to me. That's, that's, that's a circular pump of economics. That's the whole point of issuing credit. It's the whole point of currency and keeping track of debts. So I have to now take from human relations, I have to trap them in a debt economy. Once I get that, I have my Ouroboros. I have now figured out the next part of my soul equation, my soul alchemy. Now this could be done in a variety of ways. Sometimes it can be done in a very brutish way, which is basically slavery, or it can be done in a, you know, it's your fault, you fucked up kind of userous way. So however you want to twist it, there's different techniques you can do to, to trap people in this circle. But once you trap them in this circle, now you can extract the next part of the equation. And that's the quadrangle. It's the mastery of the elements. Once I have humans and I'm steering them through with the economy, now I'm saying, okay, I'm going to hire scientists here. I'm going to hire babysitters here. I'm going to hire guards here. I'm going to have all these people exploring nature to exploit nature better. They're going to learn how to steer nature. I'm steering humans, so they steer nature. That's the, that's the chain so far. Now, once I get real good at that, I now have to master my distribution. Because if I just mine up all the gold and, and I, I, I give it to everybody, then the gold doesn't have any, any value. I have to actually put a time delay in the, in, the, in the gold moving from one place to the next. Otherwise, it's just garbage. So what do I do? I need to control the distribution in the organization. So what a triangle is. It's order. It's the order from the top down. So now I have to master the, the distribution of all of the elements I'm able to extract from the planet and from each other. And you have to do that in either royalty or democracy or pick your, you know, pick your flavor of the week. And once I have that, I can now extract the final circle, which is the firmament, which is the edge of the universe. I can use that pyramid to touch the heavens. And that's what the Philosopher's Stone actually is, I think. I might be wrong, but I think that's what's going on. So it turns out that this has nothing to do with lead to, go lead to gold. This is about turning us from our default state of smoking pot and fucking off into an organized species that can actually do some pretty amazing shit, typically at the expense of ourselves, but you know, there's a price for everything. So it turns out that the, uh, we are the philosopher's stone. Humans are the philosopher's stone. How you organize us, that's the philosopher's stone. That's why it's on the back of your $1 bill. And it's an equation of how to assemble a civilization from scratch. Just give me a man and a woman, and I got it from there. I don't need anything else. So it's the ultimate leverage point. It's the ultimate Archimedean fulcrum. And all I need is just two humans. And I could, do, I could build this entire thing from two humans. So this brings back the idea of, instead of the black arts, we're going to call it the black box arts. Because that's what AIs are, the black boxes. You don't know what's going on in them. So we're going to start with the alchemical atom. Just like the equation said, start with a man and a woman. We're going to start with humans. That's where, we, that's where that starts. That's where I'm starting. 
Um, so right now we're trapped in the ultra measurement phase of science, which is basically saying everything can be turned into a math function and I don't need the rest of the body. I just need to focus on the brain. I can do psychotechnology all day long and not include the rest of the body and all this other, um, you know, impressive prestidigitation we've involved ourselves with. But this is just wrong. This is not correct because we, we're starting to see these problems. We can't, we can't translate this to, approach to AI. We can't translate this uh, approach to my Neanderthal brains. Chimeric brains, you just can't do them at all. You have to use something else entirely. So let's just, let's, let's give the scientists their, their reward and say thank you for all the help, but you can sit this one out for a bit. So we're gonna say thank you, move on little scientist guy. Let's treat humans as a black box. Let's not make assumptions about the black box. Let's just say I put things into the person, which is going to be energy and matter, and then there's going to be a behavioral output. I don't need to know what you are. I don't need to know your cultural background and all these other things. I may be able to extrapolate that or categorize it at some other point, but those are just optimizations down the line. Let's just start with the basics here. Oh, and because entropy is a thing, we have to account for waste as well. Not all input in a human becomes behavior. So what's the waste? Turns out, I think, the waste is ideas and symbols. So you get all your input, your energy, and your matter, and what is relevant and immediate becomes behavior, but if it's not, eh, just pack it in my brain. It's an idea, it's a thought. I'll get around to it. It's heat waste. It's where the, this, this is the heat sink of our input. It's not just a driver of behavior, it's both. And they, they live here in the same pace, at the same space. So let's, let's start with this concept of looking at humans, the black box human, the black box arts. Let's make transmutation chains of these humans where the output of one human is the input of another. Start with a mother, get my mouse. Come on, Mr. Come on, Mr. Mouse. Oh my God. Um, start with the mother. The output of the mother is the input of the hunter. So either it could be the mother's love, the mother's care, um, the mother's attendance. The child becomes a hunter. The output of the hunter stabilizes the tribe because they're getting food, which allows for farming. The output of the farmer goes to herbalism. And once you get all these things, you can now make weavers. And then from there, you have a leader to backtrack all these things. But also, there's also waste. There's also waste. Ideas and symbols. The waste goes to the shaman, becomes the input of the shaman. Now, the output of both of these things, when you transmute them together, open up a totally new transmutation chain where you can now have miners because the shaman and the leader are working together to organize people to do some really hard labor. And mining is fucking hard labor when it comes to the Bronze Age. You're swinging hammers. You're swinging, you're, you don't even have good tools. You're like, you're, you're buck naked in a mine just like kicking rocks and shit. Like, it's hard work. How do you get people there? Well, you need, you know, you need these two people to do it. So you actually need the, you need to recycle the waste of this part of the transmutation chain into a shaman. So then you get your miners on the output of the miner, obviously blacksmith to a tool maker, soldiers, then that produces the output of slaves. You can get builders from there. From the builders, you now have secure places to do coin minting and from coin minting, you get merchants. So this whole transmutation chain goes into place. But again, the waste has to be accounted for. The waste of the shaman and the waste of the metal workers becomes a mathematician. Now, how is that possible? Well, because the mathematician has to keep track of the logistics, which are very complicated, expensive, and heavy here. And they also have to keep track of how they're trying to find the relationship between all these numbers that they're keeping track of. So they need both of them. And the waste of both of these allow for mathematicians to come into play. That's how math got started, was keeping count of stuff. It didn't start because, you know, I wanted to troll people on the internet with a funny math meme. It's, it was practical. So then the output of the merchant becomes a linguist because they're keeping track of contracts and they're looking at trade and they're trying to sell their wares. And, and language is the easiest way to really convey those type of things. But when you merge the mathematician with the linguist, you get a banker. So from the, from the mother, I can get a banker. That's my entire transmutation chain, right? So I've assembled the humans in a way to manipulate nature each one of these people is manipulating the mat is, is, is demonstrating a mastery of the elements to build the transmutation chain, which allows me to make my pyramid. So now I have my transmutation chain. And this is where people start fucking it up. 
Because once you have these chains into play, this is where the storytellers come in. Sometimes the storytellers are useful. Most of the time, they're a bunch of assholes. And why is that the case? Because they do what's called abracadabra, which literally translates to I, I will create as I speak. That's what it means. So I can whisper at the beginning of this chain, and the idea moves through the transmutation chain. And as I put my idea through the transmutation chain, the transmutation chain changes its behavior, it changes its output. So from a whisper to the right person, I can move geopolitical chess from just a couple well-placed words, if I get it right. Storytellers eventually start to see that. They say, if I talk to this person, I get these results. And now this becomes less important. You don't have to innovate in this space anymore. You don't have to take care of your transmutation chains and, and uh, attend to their needs. You just need them to hold their place because you need the, you need the abracadabra to work. You need, you need the mythologies and the stories to work more than the actual medium in which the stories are passing through. So now you're flipping your priority, and this tends to piss these people off, understandably, and of course it tends to empower these people. Okay, so what happens? Uh, yeah, he's back. He has opinions too. He says science can help here. He's right, probably could. So how does science help? Well, let's take a look at it. It does chimeric transmutation chains. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the scientist comes in and says, well, I can make this thing called a computer and I can replace these people. Now, I didn't remove them from the chain. I didn't remove their function from the transmutation chain. It's still there. It's just not a human anymore. Okay. So then another scientist comes along and says, oh, well, I can use replace these people with robots. Okay, that's probably true. You probably want soldiers and builders and farmers to be robots. That's probably efficient. You're iterating towards this efficiency. You're, you're justifying it. It's good. It's looking great. Then someone like me comes along and says, you know, brains of our ancestors, boop, plop them in there. Now they're doing stuff. Now all of a sudden, you're still getting the transmutation effect of the chain. And the scientist is happy. The scientist is happy that you're still able to get the same effects and ideally even better. So you're, you're reducing the input needs and you're increasing the outputs. You're getting that progress and efficiency. Um, but at the same time, well, your storytellers don't work anymore. Because originally all the transmutation chains were human. But there's no point in this chain where I can inject myself and my story passes through the whole chain anymore. Because the other brain won't get it, a robot doesn't understand it, shamans don't get it. So abracadabra is gone. There's no more magic. It's, there's no more of this, of this hacking of the system. You now have to focus on the transmutation chains themselves. That's a bit of a challenge because then these guys get real mad because that's how they've been running society anyway, is these storytellers. The fucking nerds ruin the game. I mean, what is, what is, the, you know, what is the mythology of Russia interfering with the elections, right? Well, it was Russian bots. It was Russian bots doing these things. Well, you put someone in the transmutation chain, it wasn't a human. So their narrative story is busted. It doesn't work anymore. So this means our monopoly on sentience is over, basically. Because um, all of our assumptions about how society should run and what laws we should have and all these things were totally based upon a homo sapien cognition monopoly. And now we have Gaussian computation and chimera computation in the mix now. So that's gone. And uh, the measurement boys are having problems with that. They're, they're doing the Cass Sunstein nudge stuff to kind of figure out where they can, where they can make their, uh, where they can get their stories through. But it's, it's, not, it's not getting the gains it used to be. It's not having the effect it used to be. But this is where that Hermes character comes in once again. Even in, the, even in this jaws of defeat, this hopelessness that it looks like, there's actually an interpretation here in which alchemy comes raging to the front again. And it's very simple. That's the new black box. That's it. So the input is noise. The output is knowledge. And the waste of symbols. So now he's back. And now we're here. And this is why you want to use alchemy because uh, science is done. It's not done because it's not that I'm pretty, not that I'm anti science per se. I'm just like, I know when things are dead and I know when things are just extending their life unnecessarily. And science is, is Western science in particular is doing that right now. So when you, when you have these, 
types of things in play, you're going to need alchemy to make sense of it once again. It's back. And it's, it's very important to learn, to look at the world in this way, um, just as a technique, not necessarily as a reproducible methodology. Um, we're, we're not even going towards reproducibility anymore. There are AIs that come into being which find some correlation and then people depend upon that correlation holding. So yeah, yeah, yeah. trying to trying to homogenize everything into an explainable fashion, that's just long gone. So uh, Blue Church isn't like that. Sorry, but you know, that's life. Um, and so the other benefit of looking at alchemy here, and I think that's the end of my presentation, but there's one more point if my mouse worked, that was frustrating. Um, the other point here is that in addition to alchemy doing these things, uh, allowing you to make sense of what you otherwise could not make sense of, and that's the takeaway here, because the future is going to be full of things you can't make sense of. Um, alchemy is also a fantastic collection of different uh, epistemologies throughout time. Uh, you have different cultures, different interpretations of how people made sense of the unknown. That's very valuable. Um, um, material to go over when you're doing sense making uh, operations and, and training and that type of thing. So I hope that gives some clarity as to why I'm, I'm focused on alchemy so much and why I made so much reference to it in the, in the second video uh, or, the, or the second version, second video of this season um, and why, you know, the idea of like copper being the feminine, well, that's, that's an alchemical idea. What did they mean by that? You know, explore that, explore that meaning. What, what, were they, what were they using? You might as well think of, of antiquity uh, cognition, not as superstition. Just think of it like, like one of our ancestors' brains came up with it. You wouldn't dismiss it outright. Just treat the past like another culture, because it is. So I, I wouldn't just outright dismiss like Japanese thinking, because I don't like rice. I wouldn't do that. Um, I wouldn't dismiss Bronze Age thinking just because I thought that was superstitious. Um, there's some valuable stuff there, and we have the tools to mine it now. You don't have to sit there and just shun it and be like, oh, I don't have to focus on this because I'm too intelligent and I'm from academia. You don't have to do that anymore. I have AI systems that will literally parse these ancient texts, so stop being fucking lazy. Uh, anyway, that's all. Thanks. Let me unshare my screen. My mouse is broken. No. Oh, thank you so much for that, Pat. I was just thinking... What a gift, you know, I, I really appreciate that somebody is taking the time to, to break these things down. And I'm gonna start before we get into Q&A by asking some clarification questions. And so everybody else, uh, feel free to write your questions in the chat and then I can point to you and you can unmute and ask them or you can ask me to ask them for you. But before we get into that, um, maybe it's because I'm more inebriated than usual today, but there's a couple of things I didn't fully follow. So the storyteller, is the storyteller the alchemist, or is that is the alchemist something more than the storyteller? Yeah, there. So another part of soul alchemy is storytelling, because what you're doing is you're affecting the transmutation chains. So that's what the person who built the transmutation chains. That's an alchemist. The person who maintains them. That's an alchemist. And the person who's hacking them is also an alchemist. Right. And when you say use alchemy, or or be be aware of it, or recognize it is basically the cognitive tool, the slide where you had all those symbols like the quadrangle, the, the, the hierarchy and the elements. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I kept thinking about throughout this presentation was um, whether or not this relates to Carl Jung's kind of excavation of alchemy and whether or not you have any uh, knowledge of that. Um, uh, Carl Jung is my safe word. Uh, he's, uh, he's, I'm a little bit jaded on Carl Jung and it's, it's for the stupidest reason imaginable. Um, they, he, he, I should say, he, uh, he is, there was a part of hot, there's this weird part of Hollywood that worships Carl Jung. Like it's the fucking weirdest thing. Um, they, they worship the shit out of him and there are like entire armies of like sycophants and fans. Just like, if you don't, if you don't say the right thing about Carl Jung, then, oh my God. They will just slap the shit out of you. And uh, I've, I've had knockdown drag out fights with them uh, about this type of stuff. And they didn't like any of this because uh, I think that this tends to happen. Someone actually has a pretty good breakthrough and other people, it attracts people who, who try to use that understanding. 
Um, and then because they aren't Carl Jung, they don't really understand the breakthrough as well as he did. So they're just kind of, they're kind of parroting it and mimicking it and they don't know why anymore. Um, so it's, my experience has been full of those people. Um, but I know that, that Jung and Freud worked together pretty extensively and they had a, 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 a significant spiritual falling out between the two of them um, going in, in two different directions. So, I mean, the, like I said, I, I prefaced my interpretation of, of the Philosopher's Stone. I, I said that this is my particular interpretation. It's not D with a capital T interpretation. Uh, and I'm sure Mr. Young's interpretation is his as well. So that's, that's the point of alchemy. There's no methodological way of proving what's right or wrong. That's kind of the confusing part too. All right, we got a question from Peter Lindbergh. So is there any um, modern alchemists or thinkers or intellectuals that are into alchemy that you respect or would recommend? There's one. I don't respect him, but I respect his mastery of alchemy. And that's George Soros. That guy knows what the fuck he's doing. That guy knows his craft. He, whew, that is a person who has spent, he's a student of Karl Popper. Most people don't know that, right? So like, Soros is a student of Karl Popper. And, um, even wrote a book called Financial Alchemy. You know, he's, he's into that. Now, whether he's like self-identifies as one or not, I don't know. But when it comes to like modern techniques uh, of how you do alchemy in the post-industrial and the information age, he's pioneered quite a few of them. Um, so I tip my hat to understanding that, even though I don't like what he's doing with the transmutation chains. Um, but uh, he's, uh, that is one skilled motherfucker for sure. Uh, in terms of, you know, not big, bad boogeymen of globalism, I would say uh, the competent storytellers that happen on the internet right now, there's not, it's not necessarily one person as much as it's a collective. There's, there's like groups like this, for example, they're learning how to be alchemists without even knowing it, surprisingly. They're trying to make sense of the stories, the organism of the storytelling that's going on. Um, and then there's the storytellers that are constantly outwitting them. I think that's a, that's a beautiful cat and mouse game. So um, there might be some alchemy there too. Who knows? If you were to measure the effectiveness or the success of a story, uh, what are some of the attributes that you look for other than its ability to propagate across the chain? Yeah, uh, the ability to represent all three of those uh, cognitive techniques. So the chimeric, um, the Gaussian, and the human one. So if anything can actually speak to all three, that's going to be the alchemist of the future. Yeah, I I want to know if um if there's any archetypical character that kind of frees people from this hell that you're describing. <laughs> um, we kind of we kind of talked about that at the last episode of the first season um, regarding how you bring Gerardian sacrifice into the AI conflict space. So that's that's one way that can temporarily mitigate the hell we're in right now um can a human do it uh, probably not but maybe i don't have a lot of high ho hopes for humans maybe i'm a bit jaded um but uh i've 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 personally given up that that search a long time ago so i might not be the right person to ask on that one uh, just to give people more chances to uh, ask questions in the chat i'm just gonna keep going here um i can remember what i was gonna ask yeah, so somebody had a, a nice meta comment that uh, you're t or w you're telling us a story right now, right? So that's right. Is is basically our only hope? Like, let's say we we buy into this frame, is the only hope that we get better and better stories? Hmm. There's a there's a if point of diminishing. How would you define better? There's a diminishing return on stories. So at first, you do need the stories to direct the waste the output, the symbols and, and everything else. So you need stories to kind of like launder the waste of people's minds, uh, all those symbols and ideas that are in there. So stories are good at like being trashmen of ideas. Um, and it's a necessary function. Garbage collection is really important. But the um, eventually, uh, once you get to the abracadabra techniques, once you're able to whisper at one part of the chain and you can mutate the entire chain, uh, power congregates around that and abuses go nuts and the storytellers do not give up their throne easily because they don't have any other skills they're not actually craftsmen or you know people who build stuff that people want 
They just they just steer narratives. And we're seeing that fight today. They do not want to give up that power by any means necessary. So um, on one hand, storytelling is essential, and on the other hand, it can ruin civilizations if it's if it's a, a point of contention. Even Plato, I think it was Plato, no, Socrates or Plato, that no, was Plato. He said uh, storytellers rule society. He, he didn't say mathematicians or scientists. He said fucking storytellers rule society, and he's right. So there's. Is there a good story? Is there a better story? I don't know, but I know there's a cycle where you need stories to get the transmutation chain started, uh, and then storytellers come along and then abuse the shit out of them, and then around and around we go. Uh, Mandelbrot, do you have a question you'd like to ask? He's a tease. Don't mind him. <laughs> All right. Um, Mimetic Caper, I think you had a question earlier about the Philosopher's Stone equation. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask that? Don't. Uh, I gotta let you guys unmute yourselves. It's our bad. That's there we our go. Problem. There we go. Uh, let me just find the question again. Um, so, in in your version of the philosopher's stone equation, do you consider the four elements to be purely physical? Because um, there are very various symbolic meanings to the four elements uh, in astrology, and I, I think Carl Jung has some, but I'm not sure about that. Um, I'd have to look into that. Unmuting, sorry. Mastery of the four elements doesn't necessarily restrict itself to the physical control of it. We also need to control the stories about those elements, their distribution, their usage, what ideas those elements can generate. Um, you know, every part of the mastery chain implies all the symbolic stuff as well. Okay, yeah. So I, I just wanted to make sure it wasn't like purely the physical elements, like the physical world. There's a uh... Okay, that's good to know. Mandelbrot, did you want to ask a question now that you can? All right, I'm going to hand it over to Raven's question. Yeah, so my question is kind of referencing that uh, the hierarchies that you brought that originated with the mother. So do we need a new mother to begin the creation of a new chain of hierarchies? Yes. Can Eve you... was a mistake. Eve was a mistake. I'm saying it. I'm, I'm getting recorded. It was a mistake. There's actually some rather um, fascinating interpretations of Eve, uh, not just the biblical one or the uh, Ju Judaic one. There's some alchemical interpretations as well that just like burp, that totally defy the mind. Um, it's funny, the, the archetype of Eve is one of those things where you're like, okay, it's the first woman. Is that really a motherly spirit to her? I don't know of any story of Eve where it's like, oh, I'm a good mother. That's not really one of those things that propagates around. It's kind of weird when you think about that. And I, Technically, she was like Jerry Springer material. Like, I mean, just look at how she ran everything. Like the idea of like, oh, here's the tree of wisdom. And I'm afraid to, you know, eat the apple myself. So I'm going to rope in the only human I can reach and get them into the blame cycle too. And then I'm going to have kids and one's going to kill the other. That's a Jerry Springer episode, right? So, so not exactly the world's best mother. Um, I think it's probably worth reviewing uh, why Eve is not considered a mother. Uh, I would start answering your question looking at why that archetypal, archetypical association just doesn't exist. What is the pod coming to all of this? Hannah, uh, would you like to ask your question? Hello. Um, I think you've uh, spoken a couple of times about these other types of um, brains, uh, but I was wondering if you could just re-describe them again for clarity, um, the chimeric one and the AI and, you know, who, 
Who are the stories needing to go to? Mm, yes. Um, so the, the using what I'm suggesting is basically alchemical entropy. It's not just input and output, but it's also waste. And the waste is ideas and symbols and things like that. So stories are kind of like garbage collection of that waste. Um, otherwise, they just simmer in your head and they can either drive you insane or they can change your judgment making process or some way affect your behavior. Uh, so a story is a way to get those symbols out of your head. Um, and waste is a, it, admittedly, yes, it is a bad term. I'm using exclusively um, in entropic terms. Heat waste is what I mean. So it's, think of it like a input waste or, you know, just symbol waste is probably more accurate. If, um, but the, uh, the storytelling is an essential way of getting that, that waste out of your system. Um, and, and listening to stories also gets that waste out of your system too. So you don't actually have to tell the story, just listening to it is a way to get it out and flush out your system, which is good. Um, now regarding the other two contenders for cognition where we have the Gaussian stuff, which is basically AI, and then we have the chimeric, which is my nerd with all brain, please take a drink. Um, the <laughs> cheers mates. Um, <laughs> uh, the, these are brains in which we can never really truly know scientifically. Um, you can't actually just like install and now you're in and now I'm a caveman running around, look at me go. Uh, that's not actually a thing we're, we're gonna be able to do. So even from, from its very existence, it is a black box and it will always remain one. Um, the, you can get some behavioral poking and prodding out of it, poke it with input, see the output. Sure, basic psychology, of course. But what do storytellers look like for both of those things? Fantastic question. The idea of, of like, how do you tell a story to an AI? Well, it wouldn't be like a human. Remember, the idea that I'm proposing is that storytelling is a waste retrieval mechanism, a waste organizing method. So you have to identify what the waste of Gaussian computation is and then steer it. And the same thing's true for chimeric brains as well. So if my, if my categorization is, is predictive, that would be my approach, if that makes sense. Got a question from Jessica. Uh, what is the best way for someone to deprogram their minds from rigid scientific learning? Yee. Yikes. I haven't had much success in that. Uh, probably not the best person to ask. The finding, there are 13 unanswered questions in science right now. Uh, I think maybe 12. I think the Poncare conjecture was actually resolved, but there's like stuff about dark matter and that's just not resolved. Um, there are genuinely unresolved questions and there is some discussion and debate about the philosophy of science is why that is. Why hasn't, if science and all of its power and all of its predictive modeling and all of our genius and computers and our cognition and all over the place, why can't we solve these 13 points? Um, do we just need more complexity? Is, is, if we had more complexity, do we, do we resolve these questions? I don't, I don't think so. Um, this has opened up an interesting debate, I think about 10 years ago, where it got so heated as to why these questions couldn't be answered, where the debate basically boiled down to is math invented or discovered. And that's how, that's how insane the discussion got. Um, it, they were definitely theories of mind were contending pretty heavily um, in terms of what did we get wrong? Where do we make the mistake? It was, it was a glorious moment of scientific introspection, which usually doesn't happen. Uh, like you, you see, you see this introspection kind of appear in peer review and other parts of the chain, but you, you don't see it like collectively at, at, the, at the entirety of the scientific um, institutions themselves. So, uh, trying to find those points to then challenge yourself and say, okay, do I simply put faith in scientists to solve this for me, and it's a non-participation sport, and I'm just simply watching? Um, if that's the case, why do you fucking care about science? Like, <laughs> if it's if it's not if it's not participatory, then and you're just watching it like a damn commercial, then stop fucking caring, because you're just you know not not you the person the proverbial you is what I'm talking about. Um, if if you're not going to get involved, it, it doesn't matter to you. And if you think just science falls from trees if you wait long enough, great. All right, fine. That's consumer experience of science. Question: Why that's your experience of science? What are you being deprived of if that's your take? Um, what aren't you being exposed to? That's a place to start. Um, but yeah, finding, you know, seriously trying to answer why these things are unanswerable is a good way to, 
to challenge your assumptions about the scientific method. Just a quick follow up on that. Towards the end of your presentation, you said something about science being dead. Could you elaborate on that and define how you use the word science in that expression? So the scientific methodology in particular. Um, so the scientific methodology's limits are laid bare and exposed when you deal with um, Gaussian black boxes and chimeric cognition. So you're not gonna, you're not gonna get, um, cause God forbid, <laughs> like what does Neanderthal math look like? Do we, do we just assume it's just, oh, it has to follow the laws of, cheers. Does it have to follow the laws of logic just because we followed the laws of logic? Is there a biological component to what logic we're selecting for? That's the other thing. We might say, well, no, the symbols of lo logic hold definitely for all of time. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's repeatable in both the domain of the physical and the uh, mental and symbolic for sure. Yes, that's true. But what logic are we selecting for? What are we focused on? What are we improving upon at the expense of not improving upon? That is, does that hold what we're focusing on when a chimeric brain does the same thing? Maybe they focus on something else. What would a beaver do if it was trying to do math, right? What type of, would focus primarily on geometry, I'd imagine, or maybe stochastic mathematics would be its original position if it could actually do symbolic mathematics. It would intuitively understand stochastic mathematics whereas we struggle with it uh, uh, aggressively. So you throw a different brain in it, the logic it focuses on and builds and accelerates with is, is probably gonna be fundamentally different than what we're focusing on. So that's, that's what I mean by scientific methodology uh, being successfully challenged. All right, uh, Dan Yule, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question about waste? Uh, sure. I hope my bandwidth uh, holds. Uh, the question was, I'm just, yeah, I'm very curious about this notion of waste in terms of waste and story. The question is, uh, is the waste cohering into some sort of super egoic force and it's all calibrated so this AI whisperer shaman character can play it like a flute? Is that, uh, does that echo line up? Maybe. Could. Um... The ideally, yes, that's effectively what a storyteller is. They're able to, if you, if you can, a storyteller affects the transmutation chains. So, and it does that by tapping into that, into the symbolic waste. So you have these AIs, they're a transmutation chain of them. It injects one I data point or knowledge point or story or whichever, or narrative. And then all the other AIs follow suit. Now the AIs don't know they're following suit, uh, they're just following what the output of the previous one was. So yes. instead of, so acting like a whisperer, yeah, effectively. And it's, it's changing the entire transmutation change. That's, that's correct. Cool. And, and so something can be planted in the story maybe that has a time sensitive blossoming. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you. Yep. Is, is, you got one. Is, from is, yeah. No, it's on me. I have a question. So, is there a possibility that um, this kind of <clears throat> superstructure of society, of civilization, can kind of um, develop wants of its own kind of thing in line with stuff like Kevin Kelly talks about the technium having a kind of its own wants, what technology wants. It's having a level of complexity that kind of breaks away from human uh, desires and will, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, um, I mean, we're already there regarding high frequency trading algorithms and um, some of the advertising and electoral stuff that's going on. It's not even, <laughs> it's not even us doing it. We literally can't get out of the high frequency trading. We're stuck in it or we, we actually depend upon it. So um, is the technology demonstrating a want or a desire the same way we do it in symbolic terms and symbolic language? Probably not. But uh, from an evolutionary perspective, it certainly is. It's demonstrating a selection criteria at the very minimum. It's saying, you know, these type of uh, AIs get to exist, whereas other ones don't. So these get all the resources where other ones don't. And in this case, high frequency trading algorithms, they get a lot of the resources and they keep things afloat. And then there's an entire ecosystem of people who hack them. Like they will literally write blog articles to headline them just to head fake the, the high frequency trading algorithms. 
some bullshit news. So like, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff where journalists are, are, are doing that like crazy insider trading stuff and they don't get busted. And one day the SEC is going to look into them and it's going to be hilarious. Uh, but until that day comes, we depend upon those high frequency trading algorithms to, you know, make line go burr. Um, and as a result, um, it is selecting for us as much as we're selecting for it. But I think it's starting to select for us at this point. Um, so it does, it is demonstrating wants and needs. It's selecting, it's, it's demonstrating a selection pressure. Let's just leave it at that. So, uh, Pat, I have a question uh, about like geopolitical dark arts, um, mainly around Russia and the, the philosopher Alexander Dugan, because I know he's a pretty eclectic thinker and he's into, I think he flirts with chaos magic and like radical traditional orthodox uh, Christianity. Do you know anything about that? Like uh, how other kind of players are using this type of stuff that's not like blue church scientism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's an example of that's an example of the alchemy I'm talking about where you're playing with the different types of cognition um, that we've seen on the chans, this type of thing manifest where certain memes flow and other ones don't. Uh, that Pepe is just everywhere these days. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff uh, behind that. Uh, and it's not just tricking the human reader. It's also actively tricking the AIs too. And, and the humans then, the human readers are in turn tricking the AIs back at, uh, um, recursively as it goes down and down. So that's definitely, chaos magic is good. Is it alchemy? Yes, it is practicing alchemy in the traditional sense where it is, it is a black box and you, by trial and error, you say, Bing, okay, do I get the signal I want? Yes, no, okay, keep iterating, iterate and iterate. And so you actually, it's almost like, it's almost like scale invariant entropy where it's constantly reducing down to that which cannot be reduced any further. And then you build your structures on top of those irreducibles. So in the sense that they're trying to find the transmutation change between internet citizens, as well as AIs, as well as the structure of communication. It's building those, it's, it's flooding into those trans, it's flooding those possibilities and only the most viable transmutation chains are then selected, harvested, and other things are built on top of that, whether it's a political system, a religion, or anything else. So yes, um, the Russians are actively trying out this type of stuff. Uh, the Chinese have been doing it, but they have, they're, they're not very creative on this front. They, they just found a way to hack most of American progressive blue church stuff. They're not necessarily innovating the same way the Russians are. Um, the American special, uh, special operations certainly are doing so. SOCOM is doing that. Um, I know the de-radicals, de-radicalization stuff is doing that. Um, there are certain parties in Islam that are doing that. They don't get a lot of credit, uh, but Muslim Brotherhood is most certainly playing that game, and it plays it very well. So, yeah, there's definitely geopolitical contenders. Christian said something about scalar resonance, and Daniel had a question that was a follow-up on that. Daniel, would you like to ask that question? Uh, sure. I don't know what the previous, uh, let me see here. Um, yeah, I don't know what Christian was referring to ex in context of this talk, but I thought it was an interesting question. Uh, scalar re resonance. Um, I'm just wondering how one would discern whether, say, a spell or something whispered by this AI uh, is present, like when there's a scalar resonance. Scalar resonance. Could you elaborate on that concept? Well, yeah, that's the thing. It was it was uh, put in this uh, chat by Christian Hart. If they would like to speak to that, um, but I, I I hear like uh, you know I, I uh, see the meme in in a personal interaction, and it has cascading effects uh, in the larger social world. That's what I'm hearing. Oh, I see. Um, by the yeah, so the idea of of, uh, of set up to produce scalar resonance, yeah. scalar okay. resonance, scalar resonance, scalar. Okay, uh, meaning of scale, resonance, structural. Yeah, um, that's that is indicative of what I think is how human socialization works. 
So the idea of transmitting units of culture, which is a meme, or transmitting transactions financially, uh, that's, that's money. Um, transmitting signals of, you know, mating signals. All of these things are protocols of human communication and they do have structure. And by structure, mm -hmm. I mean limitations. So you, you don't, they don't have like a structure, like they have like hard code and they have like, you know, data bases and shit. That's not what I mean. What I mean is there are hard limits to what type of information can go through that and what type of information is transmuted as it goes through that. So that's the actual mm -hmm. structure itself. Um, Bumpers and gutters. Uh, yeah, right. Yes, that's right. Gutters. Yeah. Uh, okay. And so how those are time delayed between one another, um, memes are playing off of that. So, for example, the type of research that goes on when it comes to meme warfare, if, oh, like this is some horror stuff. Like I'm, I'm going to jump into two things and they're absolutely terrifying. The first is when the DOD researched memes for weaponization back in 2009. Um, they found that all kinds of stuff for starters. They found all kinds of wild stuff. And then they found well, there's a document floating around. It's on page, I think, 96, where they explore suicide memes, mm -hmm. meaning memes that drive people to commit suicide. They found repeatedly, demonstrably repeatable that suicide was contagious. Contagious. Mm -hmm. Meaning one person does it and then other people around them do it. Right. And they were able to activate that through memes alone. Mm -hmm. Right. That's fucking crazy pants. Um, mm -hmm. And then someone else decided to go further with it with something, this wonderful little space that everyone called Tumblr. Um, it turns out that when you take Tumblr and you turn it into a data science experiment, what you're doing is you're able to find mental illness and what it looks like in the data science space so that you can then identify, isolate, reproduce, promote, depromote, whatever you want to do, you can orchestrate just by the memes alone. You can say, okay, this person is, is ADHD. This person has bipolar disorder. This person has these. And I can look at the actual data science flow of that, the data science structure of that. So then I can identify people who have the same structural signature, but they don't know they're mentally ill yet. So now I can really fuck with them. And they were doing that. This, this was being done across the board for advertising, for military, academic experiments. This was being done. Um, so the, the, the scalar resonance is, is probably is, I'm taking a shot at the, at, the, at the definition here, but, um, that type of thing where I put the meme in the channel and then I get the behavior and then it spreads and then that tr tracks more and then that spreads and it keeps going. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, def it's trying for scale and variance. Memes are always trying for scale and variance. And it's every so often you get that one that just like pops off. Right. So that's how an AI can discern it. Is there a way uh, a human with a body can discern it? Not without the data. Well, right. well, uh, I shouldn't be so glib. Uh, you would need the data, but um, there are people who know when things are fucked up and they don't need the yeah. data. They'd be yeah. like, hmm, something's wrong here. They can't put the word on it and they don't have the phrase or the training or the discipline to understand all of it. Um, but they know something's off and... Uh, they get antsy. <laughs> they get antsy if you don't take them seriously. So Pat, one thing I'm trying to take away from this, um, which maybe I need to take like a day to digest, is what does this uh, skill set of alchemy mean for, say, somebody in the Zoom room? You know, we're not necessarily trying to manipulate large groups of people. I mean, I can't speak for anyone other than myself, but what what uh, does this unlock, you know, in in a normal person's life, <laughs> not a normie's life, but a normal person. Yeah. Um, I would say for the, for the average person who's like, Hey, this is some wild shit that I'm listening to. Uh, you could probably apply this to certain parts of your daily life, to be honest. Um, if, if you think you need to know the answers to everything and you need to know the knowledge parts of every point, kind of step back and just pretend that you're one of your ancestors or you didn't have science or the internet or books or other people that you can just lean on and say, Hey, solve this for me. Do my cognitive work for me. How, how did people make sense of that stuff? That's a good, that's a good practice to, to go through yourself, just to look at your daily life. Like, why do you have the friends you have? Why do you have the boss you have? Why do you have the job you have? Right. You're not going to get scientific answers on those things, but if you approach it alchemically, and then you start applying it to yourself and your own decision makings and your own paths and all these other things, you may come up with different conclusions than the conclusions you've currently been coming up with. So there's, there's value in that novelty at the very minimum.
Uh, any other key takeaways? I see Hannah mentioned that she'd like to hear today's takeaways, and so would I. Takeaway is alchemy is a valid epistemology discovery strategy. It is once again useful because metaphysics are back, and they're back because of Gaussian computation and chimeric computation. And next time you think people are stupid, which we all tend to do, step back for a minute and say, wait, what AIs are at work here? What's actually changing the flow of things? Is it that the people are stupid or is it that the Skinner box they're in is making them stupid? Um, and if, the, if your answer is the Skinner box, well, now you have the tools to actually analyze that Skinner box. Uh, so we're almost at an end. Uh, Key, I know you messaged Daniel privately saying you're formulating a question. Uh, do you have uh, it? Do you want to bring us home once again? Why does this always happen? <laughs> I don't understand. Well, I do in some ways, and I really appreciate Patrick for being able to go through these things um, and storytell in general. Um, and to be honest, I left after Emblem 21 um, because it's my dad's birthday tomorrow, guys. Oh. Happy birthday to you too, Daniel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so with all that said, thank you for the useful alchemy, um, even though I haven't listened to it yet, and I will, hello. <laughs> um, so a question uh is on eve i guess because that's an interesting symbol for sure um and it's because that's the first thing that i came into when i joined the zoom call um oh, when man. yeah <laughs> um uh when raven asked the question so oh thank you quips um can you explain the answer to raven's question again if that's okay yeah it's uh, it's the the idea uh, i started my example with woman um, and I started there because that's where you start with soul alchemy. You start with a man and a woman. You're supposed to start there. Um, and when she was asking, maybe if you get a new mother, you get a totally different transmutation chain. That's true. Um, and that, then she asked about the archetypes of mothers that existed. And I just went off on Eve because, grr. Um, but the, uh, the, the idea of Eve, not, Eve is rarely associated with like motherly acts and, I wonder why right? there's a there's an interesting lack of that type of storytelling behind the Eve uh, the Eve mythology where it's not a loving mother she's not a caring mother she she's just like maybe she's just on on the hook for her mistakes for all of time who knows um, but the motherhood part is just completely glossed over regarding Eve's actions and um, I think that's worth exploring why that is. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, I, I don't mean to say that in a like quippy way. Um, it's just because there was another point about the Girardian interpretation of Eve, if you know, if I don't know that one. And then the other thing that came to mind when you mentioned that is um, like the symbolism for Mary. And isn't like Adam and Eve like the children of God first before like being um, a, a mother to children? Um, but it makes me sort of very curious about this, those symbols. So I'll mm -hmm, definitely mm -hmm. be reading into that. Yeah, there's, there's some wild interpretations depending upon what sect you're looking at and what time you want to look at that sect too. Because the Christians have a, through all the sects, they have very different interpretations. Um, the same through Judea, the same for the Gnostics. Um, the most interesting one I've read was that they weren't necessarily the children of God they were the fire of God. And that's a, that was a mistranslation, the idea of birth of. Instead, Adam was the fire of God and Eve was the fire of Adam. Now that's, that's a wildly different interpretation. Um, the idea of fire meaning, you know, fire is one of the first things that mankind could actually spread logarithmically or exponentially. So I light this thing on fire, then everything's on fire, right? So it's the very first exponential technology. So the idea of the fire of God, we are the exponential technology of God, and Eve is the exponential technology of Adam. So that's a fundamentally different way of looking at that entire mythology. So that's why I say maybe it's worth re revisiting that type of stuff. Very cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. With that, we'll bring it to a close. 
Um, let's give it up for Pat. Thank you so much again for your time and for taking us through this journey. Uh, I'll turn it over to Peter to plug a couple things and then uh, we'll call it. Cool. You can see his face. <laughs> I'm here. Um, yes. Uh, Monday. Next week, stacked event at the, the STOA. Um, I'll just plug to Jonathan Peugeot. Um, he's coming in on Monday. I forget what time, but it's the ecstasy of uh, 2020. He's going to talk about COVID, the riots, and all that shit. Check that out. And then uh, Kira the Don and John Verveke is coming in. We're going to listen to a song, Steal the Culture. Uh, that was, uh, John mentioned that term here at the Stoas for a session. Kira the Don made it to some cool, um, you know, dance song. And we're going to listen to that. And then we're going to talk about how we're going to steal the culture. So check that out. Really cool. Um, yeah. I think for Daniel's birthday, we're going to uh, get drunk, eat some cake, and then take him to an underground strip club. So uh, you can live vicariously through us there. COVID-friendly strip club. <laughs> Six feet. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much for your questions. Have a wonderful weekend. See you, folks. Thanks a lot. Pat, you want to stay on? Yes, sir. Like taking these people out. We didn't stop the Yeah. Oh no.